Mr. Kozol, good morning. Uh, may it please the court. Um, I'm Joel A. Kozol, and I represent the plaintiffs, uh, George L. Connie et al., in this matter. <clears throat> Two years ago, we uh, appeared before this court seeking to uh, quash the certification by the Attorney General of an initiative which was also entitled an act to protect dogs, uh, which was put forth by substantially the same advocates of the present petition but and the to enjoin the there, The basis for uh, us saying it was improperly certified is entirely different than what we've got here, is it not? The, the, the issues that we have here were never reached. Correct. Two years ago, they were briefed. But the, that, the issues that were reached two years ago aren't here. That is correct, Your Honor. Right. That's right. Two years ago, the uh, case was dismissed because uh, the proposed initiative contained correct. related matters. Correct. Uh, but my point is that the issues of uh, the local exclusion, exclusion of local matters, right. and the taking were issue reached. were thoroughly briefed argued before the Attorney General and here and in oral argument. And when the statute, the proposed uh, initiative, was refiled in 07, um, uh, we stated our opposition uh, to, at the Attorney General's office and told him uh, that uh, our opposition was based on all of the uh, reasons set forth in our prior briefs and in our prior submissions to the Attorney General. The Attorney General uh, has taken the position here that he uh, need not consider, in connection with a local exclusion, uh, any factual matter that appears in the records of state agencies. He takes the position that his inquiry is limited to a facial review of the proposed initiative. No, he does not say that. A facial review of the proposed initiative, which, that's what the Yankee case says he can't do. But she can't do. I mean, she has to go beyond that. He has to go beyond that. He only goes beyond that to take uh, official notice. He'd have to take judicial notice if there was anything he could take judicial notice. But under Yankee uh, 1 and 2, he his position is he only takes official notice of anything that's within his or her, as the case is now, expertise. But he specifically says he has declined, and he has done this two years ago. He did this in this court during oral argument two years ago, and he does it in his present brief that they declined to take notice of facts that might be within the expertise of, expertise of other state agencies. But, page but, four of his brief. But Mr. And Kozol, could I just ask you about that? Uh, it seemed to me that well, one of the points that the Attorney General was making in that regard was that um, what's in the files of the Racing Commission, for example, um, may be third-party information, and it's pretty clear that the Attorney General does not have to sort of undertake a hearing process to sort out what is or isn't fact or make judgments about that. So. I mean, there's got to be some discretion in the Attorney General, don't you think, in terms of what it is that she is going to look at in terms of a factual matter and, and what she says is really would take me beyond what is appropriate in this context? Well, um, I think uh, there are limits beyond which the Attorney General has need not go. Uh, Yankee 1 and 2 makes it clear that he's not going to hold extensive hearings he doesn't have, but matters which can swiftly be determined as a matter of fact uh, and which, uh, as in this case, uh, with the essence of the local exclusion argument, that is the fact that there were only two locations in which uh, dog racing, paramutual dog racing was conducted, that uh, there hadn't been a commercial track, that had been sought a, a license uh, for over about 50 years, and that there had been no uh, dog racing, paramutual dog racing at uh, any fairs in over 25 years was very relevant to the issue of whether this initiative uh, only impacted 
two localities. But what, what about the, and I'm not going to remember the case, but you will, what about the language that the, uh, if, if I have this correct, that the, whether something is local or not, you, ha you do have to look at the face of the language of the, of the initiative petition. You look at the, uh, that's your starting point, and then you look at the uh, impact of, of the statute. I mean, the Constitution itself, uh, the constitutional requirement is to look at, at uh, the operation. You see if the operation of the proposed initiative is restricted to particular localities, the operation. Uh, Yankee 1 tells us the Attorney General should consider a petition's factual impact in determining whether to certify that a petition does not contain excluded subjects, not satisfied by a facial review of the petition. So it seems clear under the prior decisions of, of this court that you must look first at the statute, but then you must determine what its factual impact Mr. is. Mr. Kozol, for, for, forgive me, but I'm looking at uh, footnote three of the Attorney General's brief in which she says she did take notice. Uh, I'm looking at footnote three of the Attorney General's brief in which she says she did take notice um, of certain facts, um, the licensure in 2007 and prior years, the fact that dog racing involved, you know, the Racing Commission's 2006 annual uh, report. So it's not as if she didn't look at anything. Well, he looked, he looked, uh, she. as the record indicates, at the fact that there were two dog tracks presently in existence. Right. Okay. He looked at a statute which permits a third dog track and which permits racing at fairs under certain conditions, okay? What he refused to do is to recognize or to consider that there had not been an application for a third uh, dog track since 1961 and that there had not been a uh, dog racing at any fair in over 25 years. As a matter of fact, the question came up when we were arguing the case two years ago. Uh, Justice, Mr. Justice Ireland specifically asked Mr. Sachs if, in this case, aren't there just two locations where we have dog racing? And he answered, there are two locations that we currently have dog racing. But dog racing, when this petition would become effective, dog racing would be allowed at state and county fairs in a third place which could be anywhere in the Commonwealth. And then but Mr. That's Justice. That's correct. Pardon? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. Then Mr. John, Justice Allen said, well, your brother says that as a practical matter, they haven't had dog racing at a state and county fair for many years. Do you agree with that? And Mr. Sachs said that may be true, but we don't look at the factual impact. We look at whether the law on its face, and this court has said so many times, going back to town of Washington versus Cook, we look at whether the law on its face established a uniform rule statewide, not whether the law would actually have impact in particular cities and towns. And we right. say that's error. That's the position he took two years ago in his briefs. That's the position he's taking now. Well, he says... Are you saying that town of Washington versus Cook is no longer good law? Well, the, I think town of Washington versus Cook is limited to its its facts, and we have uh, statements in a number of these cases which talk about, uh, and especially in the option cases and the delegation cases, uh, which deal with uh, opt-outs and opt-ins, uh, and when, when we, in this case, we have a legislature that says dog racing is banned throughout this Commonwealth, this is what Chapter 128A says, except in three locations and the potential of fears. So the legislature has localized the whole issue. In order to get dog racing, you have to have a county vote, you have to have hearings within the locality, and you have to comply they cannot, with the, the local zoning laws. The fact of the matter is that there are only two dog tracks, and there have been only two dog tracks for over 50 years, and there have been no fair 
fairs conducting dog racing for over 25 years. So with this sort of a record, does this initiative now have an impact only on particular localities? That's what Article 48 of the... But Mr. Kozo, what about another case? I think it's an opinion of the justices where I, I believe the court said this does not fail for local matters, even though as a practical, the language was statewide, as a practical matter, the only impact of that law was going to be the city of Boston. I think it was a rent control provision well, or something. We have, uh, we have cases uh, like uh, the case dealing with uh, the, uh, uh, Metro, uh, the uh, Mass Transport Authority, okay, uh, in which this court looked at it and its effect, control of some, said local exclusion applies. That we have uh, the city of Boston case uh, in which there is an opinion of the justices which uh, said that uh, even though the fact that uh, the principal impact is on one place, the city of Boston and surrounding municipalities, uh, the statute has statewide application. Here, the statute does not have statewide application because the legislature has already ba banned dog racing in all but three localities. It has localized the issue. Wait, and county fairs. And county fairs. Yeah. All over the state. Well, right. but, the, the, but, but now the question comes down to whether or not uh, this statute has any impact on county fairs which Your Honor is correct in stating under the conditions, uh, if they complied with the conditions of a county vote and all that, it's a potential, but it's not realistic. But I it hasn't happened in 25 years. I, I don't, I thought so the question is, does the proposed initiative have any impact as a realistic matter on any locality other than Raynham, Massachusetts, and Suffolk, uh, count, uh, uh, Boston, where Wonderland Track is located. And the answer to that is, if the Attorney General's duty is to be the gatekeeper and to weed out uh, all the initiatives that really are directed uh, at a local situation, which in reality is what this is, then this petition, uh, this initiative should be excluded under Section 2 of Art Article 48. And uh, again, I think just as we were two years ago, we're faced with a, with a question of what is the reality here? Could, I, could I ask you a question about that? I'm, I, sure. And I, I, don't, I don't purport to, to, to uh, have your basis of knowledge here, but if you have a an initiative such as this one where the proponents, I take it, are saying, look, we want to ban in all of the Commonwealth. We want no dog racing. We don't care where it is. It could be in every city. It could be in one. We're not concerned about Boston. We're not concerned about Taunton. We're just saying this is a statewide initiative, and we want the people of this state to vote on this. And if, if, that's, where, if that's what the initiative is doing, it isn't really a local matter, in a, is it? Well, I think it is, Your Honor. I think, uh, I think the answer to that is that uh, the legislature, obviously, has thought what it wanted to have statewide, and it set up this pattern, all right? Now, these people come in, and they say, well, you know, we really want to ban dog racing. And they can say, and we want to ban it statewide, but it's already banned statewide with exceptions. Well, and not the fairs. And, but the, uh, the, the power of the initiative is not coextensive with the power of the legislature. You have to take the exclusions into account. And the exclusion in the statute says that if the operation of that statute is restricted to particular lo localities, if the impact, Mass Teachers case, the consideration 
must be given to the effect of a particular statute to ascertain whether it affects only particular localities. So it's a question of, are you going to use the words or are you going to use the reality? And uh, if I can close by simply stating we uh, should adopt again the proposition that we don't check common sense at the door. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kozo. Mr. Sachs. Good morning, Your Honors. Peter Sachs, Assistant Attorney General for the uh, Attorney General and Secretary. This Court doesn't need to reach the question of what matters the Attorney General should take uh, official notice of because even on the expanded set of facts that plaintiffs would ask this Court to order the Attorney General to consider, they haven't made out uh, their argument that this petition addresses a local matter. But I do want to just briefly address that issue of official notice. In the Yankee 2 case, this Court said that it would defer to the Attorney General's reasonable determinations of what facts are noticeable. And I'm quoting here, beyond question, the person best qualified to determine the extent of his expert knowledge is the Attorney General. In that regard, we shall not lightly substitute our view of what are the officially noticeable facts for that of the Attorney General. The question here is, does the Attorney General need to take official notice of matters that are buried in the files of other state agencies, including third-party assertions that even those agencies may not have uh, verified, and that certainly the proponents of the petition would want a chance to dispute? Um, the Attorney General has determined that that is not feasible. The, uh, following this Court's direction in the Yankee case is not to undertake extensive fact findings. As the Court said in the Associated Industries case in 1994, an expanded view of the Attorney General's authority to bar ballot access is not warranted. If facts outside of official notice might conceivably show that e even an apparently excluded matter is not in fact excluded, our role, the Court's role, is not to prevent the people from voting on the proposal. We follow the firmly established proposition that Article 48 is to be construed in favor of the voters' rights to vote on uh, proposals unless it is reasonably clear that the proposal contains an excluded matter. Neither the Attorney General nor this Court should prevent the <coughs> proposal from appearing on the ballot. Mr. The can I ask you, Mr. S tie goes to the runner. Mr. Mr. Sachs, yes. I understand your argument, but let me, let me turn just for a moment <coughs> to the local matters exception. Uh, if, in fact, the uh, paramutual dog racing statute in Massachusetts were to say there shall be two racetracks in Massachusetts, one shall be located in Bristol County and one in Suffolk, yes. and they cannot operate or locate until there is a hearing and a vote of the population of those counties. Um, let's say that's the framework. That's, as a practical matter, that is the framework, but let's say it was legislated well, legally. Well, I, I have to disagree with it, that it is, a pr as a practical matter, the framework, because currently, with the law that would be in effect on December 31st of 08, which would be superseded by this proposed law, would not say one of them has to be in Bristol County, one of them no, has no, to no, be No, 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 I, I understand okay. that. As a I'm practical matter, As a practical yes. matter, we have it, two operating yes. racetracks. Correct. Do I, do I have the Correct. county wrong? Is it Bristol? It's Taunton is in Bristol? Yes. 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 So I, I have Bristol? the counties right. There's uh, one in well Bristol and one in Well, it's Raynham, actually, where the, it's located. But anyway, but whatever. Yeah, that's where counties. they are. But the law does not say which counties it has to be in. And there could be a third that could be I hear, hear, You're missing my point, and I'm, I'm not being very I'm articulate. Sorry, Let's no. say the law said yes. it shall, there shall be two racetracks, no more than two, one of them in Bristol, <clears> one in Suffolk. They cannot yes. operate until there's a vote of the, yes. of the citizens of the county. Right. And then this petition comes along. Yes. Would that be a problem under the well, local matters um, exception? Under the, this court's decision in Ash versus Attorney General, a 1994 decision on rent control, no, that would not be a problem because the authority mm -hmm. to conduct racing had to come from the legislature in the first place. And what this court said in Ash is because the authority had to come from the legislature in the first place, it is by definition a statewide matter. Now here, in the 1800s, uh, the legislature codified common law uh, by enacting a statewide policy that made gambling on animal races uh, a public nuisance and a crime. In 1934, the legislature made a limited exception to that policy for dog and horse racing. Today, it, yes, dog racing could, uh, occurs as a matter of fact in two places. It could still legally occur in any county in the Commonwealth. Um, in, isn't factually, that the, it occurs isn't by that historical the end, accident isn't in two that places. The, isn't that the end of the question? that it could occur, yes, and this um, ban is phrased as a statewide ban because the petitioners don't want to just stop racing in Raynham and Revere. Uh, they want to stop it everywhere. And if they had a petition that said there shall be no racing in Raynham or Revere, I, I, that 
that although you still have the ash rule to contend with, it is a closer case. But that's not what this petition says. And it's not just a matter of clever drafting. It's a matter of what the petitioners actually want to accomplish, which is to stop racing everywhere in the Commonwealth that it could legally occur. Now or in the future. Now or in the future. And the so fact if suddenly, that if suddenly, for whatever reasons, the county fairs and all decided that they wanted to have dog <coughs> racing again. Correct. Th they could have them. Yes. And plaintiffs have said, oh, this is just a matter of clever drafting, and anyone could draft their way uh, into a, a law that's phrased generally, even if it has just local impacts. Well, no, it's not just a matter of clever drafting. It's what the uh, petitioners actually want to accomplish. They're not just concerned about what's happening in Revere and Raynham. They are concerned about banning this statewide because they believe that it has moral and social costs that affect the entire Commonwealth. And when you talk about looking at the factual impact of the petition, the plaintiffs would have you focus just on the tracks uh, patrons and employees and owners and vendors and say, oh, this only affects people in a limited geographic area. They completely want to exclude from this uh, inquiry uh, those people who stay away from the tracks because they believe that the tracks have a moral and social cost for the Commonwealth as a whole and want to end what's going on at those tracks and make sure it doesn't happen anywhere in the Commonwealth. So when you talk about the factual impact of this petition, it's not just on the people who go to the tracks who benefit economically from the tracks, but it has a factual impact uh, because of the moral and social costs that may occur throughout the Commonwealth. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm s skipping issues, sure. but um, one of the issues that the plaintiffs raise is that um, uh, this idea about the penalty being um, uh, a minimum penalty is set, but nothing, there's the, no maximum. The delegation the issue? The delegation issue. Yeah. And I take it your response is, that's for later. That's correct, because but, the impermissible... But if it's so... It, uh, here's my question. It's the, maybe it's theoretical. If something is patently problematic, do you really have to wait till later? Yes, you do, Your Honor, because as this Court said in the Bow case, confronting that exact language in uh, Article 48 about how the people's... Uh, the, the limitations on the legislative power of the people are the same as those on uh, uh, the legislature. This Court in Bow looked at that language and said, no court can interfere with the process of legislation, no matter how unconstitutional it may be, until it's enacted. And you have someone withstanding who comes before the court and challenges it. Now, in addition to this court having said... So you're not Bo certifying that this would be a constitutional statute if it were passed? You're no, not, in your certification, you're not, not certifying that this is a constitutionally... No, no we only statute. certify certifying. that it doesn't contain excluded matters, and, and an impermissible delegation is not an excluded matter. Neither is an equal protection violation or a due process violation. We couldn't refuse to uh, certify a petition, even if it was patently violative of the equal protection or due process clauses. The minute it got enacted, someone with standing could come in and get it invalidated. But the Attorney uh, General's role is carefully limited, and this was discussed extensively at the Constitutional Convention in 1917-18, and a limited list of excluded matters was developed. Now, in addition to the fact that the delegation challenge isn't open now, there are three reasons why uh, the uh, failure to specify a maximum penalty is not fatal to this law. First of all, um, in the Hasiotis case cited in both briefs, where a statute fails to specify a maximum penalty, this court has said that there's no constitutional problem with, spec with uh, applying the minimum penalty. This statute says... You mean uh, as the maximum? Sorry. Applying the minimum as the maximum? In a, is that what you mean? No, uh, applying the minimum. Without determining what the maximum might be, as long as the minimum is applied, then there's no constitutional problem with that. Secondly, um, this court, the, the, if this proposed law were to become law, the, uh, the severability clause would also become law. And the problem that plaintiffs have identified with the statute is that it says not less than $20,000. If you took the words not less than out so that it just said a penalty of $20,000, that the rest of the statute is clearly severable from those three words. So that problem is eliminated. And there's a third answer uh, which revolves around Chapter 279, Section 5, in a case called Commonwealth versus the Juvenile, which is cited in my brief. The, the, the claim that the entire statute is invalid because there's no maximum penalty uh, is just, it just won't wash for three different reasons. Uh, I would like to get back to the local matters issue. Um, differential factual impact has never been held a ground for excluding a matter under the local matters exclusion. The fact that a, a matter might have um, even different legal impact in different places uh, has not been held to be 
uh, to exclude it. So long as it has some impact, some legal impact uh, throughout the Commonwealth, so long as it's phrased in general terms that are not geographically descriptive, either explicitly or implicitly of particular areas, then it's not excluded. This Court has not looked at the factual impact. And I would like to make a note about the 1938 opinion of the Justices, which has been mentioned. It actually had to do with establishing um, taxi stands oh, in cities thanks. and towns. Um, there is a, a bit of a curious statement in that opinion, um, and we quoted it in our brief, which says that a generally applicable law is not excluded even if it would work a change in law for the city of Boston only. That felt funny to me, and I went back and looked at the laws that were actually at issue there, not only the initiative petition, but the laws that were um, in place governing taxi stands in Boston and a, a general law governing, allowing other cities and towns to regulate traffic. If you look at those laws, you'll see that the law proposed that was at issue in that 1938 opinion actually did change the law throughout the Commonwealth, uh, not just in Boston. And what the justices were doing were paraphrasing the uh, legislature's question, which said, is this law excluded uh, because it would work a change in law for the city of Boston only? If you look at the proposed law and you look at the, the existing laws at the time, it would not have changed the law in the city of Boston only. It did, it was generally phrased, and it would have changed the applicable law everywhere, just as this would. By plaintiff's logic, um, if you had a, a, consider a law that proposed three casinos in Massachusetts, so long as they're in different counties and not within uh, 25 miles of each other. By plaintiff's logic, that law would be a local matter that could neither be proposed by initiative petition nor repealed by referendum. That, I submit, is an absurd result. It's not required by the language of the exclusion. Uh, it's, not, it's contrary to the purpose of the exclusion, which is to keep matters of local parochial concern off of the ballot. To suggest that this uh, proposed ban on dog racing is of concern only around Revere and Raynham just uh, uh, doesn't wash. Doesn't wash. Thank you, Your Honor. Used that before. It, that, those are, that, that would be the Attorney General's perspective. By plaintiff's logic, a ban on wind farms or an attempt to regulate wind farms ab ab above a certain <coughs> size would be a local matter because currently there are only two significantly sized wind farms now proposed that we're aware of, one down on the Cape and one out in the towns of Florida and uh, a nearby town in in Western Massachusetts. Plaintiffs would say, well, there are only two of these as a factual matter, so what, you know, they're only of concern in those areas. What business do the voters of the rest of the Commonwealth have uh, weighing in on that? So plaintiffs would stop the voters from regulating a matter uh, uh, and establishing a statewide policy simply because the immediate factual impact might not be felt everywhere. Plaintiffs would uh, prevent the voters from nipping a problem in the bud acting proactively to regulate a problem before lots of properties are developed and property owners um, claim they've developed some kind of vested interest in a particular use. Uh, plaintiffs say uh, you can't act and establish a, a statewide policy unless there's a statewide problem. Uh, and from the perspective of the petitioners, there is a statewide problem in the sense that you can have uh, dog racing in any county in the Commonwealth. As a historical accident, it's only occurring in two places right now, but it could occur anywhere. They want to stop that. They want the people of the Commonwealth to have a chance to stop that. And we make this point in our brief, but I, I think it's worth uh, saying aloud. Uh, th this, essentially, this very petition was on the ballot in the year 2000. And the vote on the petition was a very close vote. Uh, the yes, the petition carried nine out of 14 counties. The petition had the lowest blank rate of any of the eight questions on the ballot that, that year, including three tax cutting measures. Uh, so while an actual vote on a, uh, an actual measure of the statewide level of voter interest could never salvage a petition that fell squarely within the words of the local <coughs> minutes exclusion, this petition not only doesn't fall within the words, but you have some empirical proof that it is not a matter of parochial local interest. Uh, it is a matter of interest to voters throughout the Commonwealth. Plus it has a sort of statewide financial impact, doesn't it? I mean, well, the folks that go <laughs> gamble, we know, we know they're betting on dogs, horses, whatever, they're going to lose. That is another... So less for income taxes, less for, you know, for state property, uh, local property taxes, all the other stuff that goes with loss of revenue. 
Uh, they tax you one way or the other, trust me on this. Well, I, I would suggest that the, the complexities of determining the economic impact of this proposal money are another reason tickets. that the court should not get into detailed factual analysis of whether a matter, uh, whether a, a proposed law has factual impact here, there, or everywhere. Raynham Revere or, or Provincetown to Pittsfield. Uh, as a matter of law, this petition would ban dog racing everywhere. You don't have to look uh, at what its effects on the revenues of the Commonwealth would be, what people are losing money on, or that they could be spending on economic activity elsewhere in the Commonwealth. Those are very difficult, time-consuming uh, factual inquiries that neither the Attorney General nor this Court uh, wants to or, or needs to get into. This is a statewide matter. Uh, it should be allowed to go to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Sachs.